Hello and welcome to this news live from Islamabad. I'm Jawad Dehami and these are the headlines. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan and Army Chief General Kamajabed Bajwa have discussed the latest situation along the line of control in the wake of India's ceasefire violations. According to the Prime Minister's office, the two sides exchanged views on human rights violations in occupied Kashmir during a meeting in Islamabad. Discussing the national security situation, they condemned the last week terror attack in Balochistan and vowed to bring the perpetrators to justice. The Director General of Inter-Services Intelligence, Lieutenant General Faz Hamid, also attended the meeting. Pakistan's military says security forces have broken the backbone of the terrorists and helped improve the security situation. During a press briefing, DGISPR Major General Babri Iftikhar said the last decade was full of challenges when foreign elements tried to destabilize Pakistan. He said India has intensified attacks on the civilian population along the line of control, committing over 3,000 ceasefire violations last year. Iftikhar said due to Pakistan's efforts, various world organizations exposed India's state of financing and fake propaganda against Islamabad. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has ordered the construction of 800 new settler homes in the occupied West Bank. Palestine has condemned the latest announcement, accusing Israel of racing against time to build settlements before U.S. President Trump leaves office. The U.S. House of Representatives has decided to impeach President Donald Trump, calling him a threat to democracy. The Democrat-led House plans to introduce a charge of incitement of insurrection over Capitol Hill rights. Speaker Nancy Pelosi said the House will call on Vice President Mike Pence to wrest the powers of the presidency from Trump. The global number of coronavirus cases has surpassed 90 million with more than 1.93 million deaths. Meanwhile, Japan has discovered a new variant of the new coronavirus in people arriving from Brazil. China has reported 85 new locally transmitted cases of COVID-19, its biggest daily increase in more than five months. In Pakistan, over 1,800 cases and 32 fatalities were recorded overnight that pushed the death toll to 10,676. And in tennis, eighth seed Frances Tiafo beats fellow American John Fratangelo 6-4, 3-6, 6-1 in the second round of Delray Beach Open. Tiafo will now face the winner of the late match pitting British Cameroon Nori and third seeded French Adrian Manarino. In another contest, fourth seeded Polish Schubert Orkash comfortably downs Colombia's Daniel Alahi 6-2 and 6-2. the headlines and detailed stories right after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back and now for the news in detail. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan and Army Chief General Kamajavid Bajwa have discussed the latest situation along the line of control in the wake of India's ceasefire violations. According to Prime Minister's office, the two sides exchanged views on human rights violations in occupied Kashmir during a meeting in Islamabad. Discussing the national security situation, they condemned last week's terror attack in Balochistan and vowed to bring the perpetrators to justice. 11 coal miners were killed in the terrorist attack in Qatar. 
Director General of Inter Services Intelligence, Lieutenant General Faz Hamid, also attended the meeting. The Pakistan Army says India is trying to destabilize the country through promoting terrorism. At a press briefing, DGISPR, Major General Babar Iftikhar said the EU disinfo lab has exposed New Delhi's planned propaganda against Pakistan. He said India has been peddling anti-Pakistan social media campaign for the last 15 years to malign its image. He added that India has intensified attacks on the civilian population along the line of control. Major General if the heart said India has committed over 3,000 ceasefire violations last year. He went on to say India has been committing gross human rights violations in occupied Kashmir. Responding to a question, he said the security situation in Balochistan has significantly improved due to efforts by the law enforcement agencies. The military's spokesperson said security forces have broken the backbone of the terrorists. He also said the army will ensure the safety of the China-Pakistan economic corridor. And for more on this, uh, we are joined by Defence Analyst Brigadier Nadir Mir. So thank you for your time at Indus News. Uh, first of all, Pakistan's military has reiterated that India is involved in promoting anti-Pakistan agenda by abetting terrorism, fomenting chaos and targeting economy. How do you explain this? Today, the DGISPR, General Babar, was very succinct, clear and brief, that is, in explaining how India is going about waging all facets of war against Pakistan, inclusive of what you've just said. I, Brigadier Nazir Mir, as chairman of Pakistan National Reform Movement, that is PNRM, have been saying for the last few years that India is waging an undeclared war against Pakistan. And Pakistan, despite all its endeavors for peace and stability in these regions, its efforts for Afghan peace has found India to be the spoiler in Afghanistan and on the eastern front or eastern border of Pakistan, frontier of Pakistan, despite all Pakistani efforts of last two decades for peace, which the Indians took as appeasement, the Indians have been answering Pakistan with their various forms of warfare, hybrid, asymmetrical, fifth generation, the media, you name it, and it's part of their campaign at the global level, at the regional level, and uh, fermenting terrorism in Pakistan and supporting all kinds of dissidents and creating all kinds of mayhem and consternation in Pakistan. That's the Indian agenda. So this Indian policy is clear. The policy is anti-Pakistan. It's a policy of confronting Pakistan in various forms. So the question is, what, are, what is Pakistan going to do about it now? I say, as chairman of Pakistan National Reform Movement, that it is high time that we answer the Indians in the same point. In fact, more than that, our response should be disproportionate so that this comes to an end and peace can prevail in this part of the world. And peace will not prevail till we answer the Indians in the language that they understand. There is, so Pakistan needs to review its policy and Pakistan National Reform Movement has been saying India is the enemy and Kashmir is Pakistan. And we have not said that out of malice or prejudice or any kind of chauvinism or any kind of uh, extremist uh, agenda in our views. We have no extremist agenda. We, we, we are Pakistanis are a peace-loving nation, but peace cannot be obtained or cannot be had if you are the enemy is, is implacable like the Indians are. So we have to answer the Indians in the same coin and more than that. And we have the capability and we should do it as a policy. So Major General Babri Iftikhar said Pakistan is being subjected to the fifth generation warfare. Would you please shed a little bit of more light on this? The point is that warfare has gone into to many generations and the generation that you're talking now, the fifth generation, or you can name it something else also, has many facets. It has numerous faces and it has numerous uh, angles to it. So it's not only warfare that is between two armies or two militaries or two political camps. It's one which is invo involving various domains, which includes political, economic, social, cultural, linguistic, and so many others, and not just uh, nationally at the Pakistan level, at the regional level, at the global level. And the point to understand is that basically the language, the uh, war that India is waging, fifth generation, you, we call it, and we can give it other names also, hybrid and asymmetrical, which are overlapping and having many things in common. 
But the main theme is that the policy that the Indians are adopting against Pakistan is a policy which is called confrontation. That means war in various forms, which is what they are doing against Pakistan. So Pakistan is left with no choice but to answer the Indians. And we have the capability, we have the national will and resolve. Our people are brave. The Pakistani nation is resilient. We have very brave armed forces and professional soldiers who have been giving sacrifices against some larger adversary, which is India, and who are ready prepared today to wage all kinds of war. So most recently we have seen, in fact, the entire world has seen the EU Disinfo Lab has exposed Indian network working to malign Pakistan by influencing decision makers at the UN and the EU. But we haven't seen any firm response by the international community on this. So what do you say about it? Well, the reason is that the Indians have been doing this for a long time. It's not only like uh, the point of this EU in disinformation lab and all the, the Indian endeavors at EU level and this have been raised. But it's not just EU where they're doing it. They have been doing it in BRICS. Uh, in, in, they've been telling the Russians about, uh, I mean, against us. They've even tried to get the Chin Chinese our friends uh, away from us. They've even tried it in the Gulf. See, the relations that Pakistan had in the uh, West Asia or in the Saudi Gulf, GCC, and the relations we have today. And wherever you find, you will find the Indian hand in it, which has tried its best to drive a wedge or to uh, carry out propaganda or do fifth generation war or any other form of name you want to give it against Pakistan. So the Indian effort against Pakistan is not limited to this region or to any other region of the world. Brigadier Nadimi, thank you for talking to Indus News. We really appreciate that. And now moving on, the Afghan military says it has killed 17 Taliban fighters while removing their check posts on Baghlan Bal Highway. The military accused the Taliban of extorting people on the highway. It said the commando forces took part in the operation and they will continue their efforts to block such attempts. The defense ministry said it has also killed dozens of Taliban fighters in an airstrike in the Fara province. The ministry said the air raid was carried out during retaliatory attacks in the Pashtrud district. Meanwhile, the Taliban say four soldiers were killed in an attack on their checkpoint in the Balkh province. Karim Khalili, leader of Afghanistan's hizb e wahdat -e islami has arrived in Pakistan on a three-day visit. Khalili will call on Prime Minister Imran Khan, Ford Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi and other dignitaries. Pakistan's Foreign Office says the visit is part of its policy to reach out to the Afghan political leadership to forge a common understanding on the peace process. The visit coincides with the second round of the intra-Afghan talks between Kabul and the Taliban in Doha. The two sides are negotiating on the core agenda of the talks after agreeing on the mechanism and terms in round one. It's time for a short break. We'll be back with more stories. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Yemen Zuthi rebels say they reserve the right to respond to any U.S. move to blacklist them. The statement comes after the Trump administration announced its intent to designate the group as a terrorist organization. In a tweet, the spokesperson, Muhammad Ali Al Houthi, alleged the U.S. policies a source of terrorism. Earlier, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said the U.S. will designate the Houthi group as a terrorist organization on January 19. Pompeo said he also wants to designate three Ansarullah leaders as global terrorists. He said the move will confront Ansarullah's terrorist activities in Yemen. Earlier, aid groups expressed concerns that the move can complicate efforts to combat the world's largest humanitarian crisis. In Israel, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has ordered 800 homes to be built for Jewish settlers in the occupied West Bank. The announcement comes ahead of President-elect Joe Biden's inauguration on the 20th of January. Palestinians have condemned Israeli settlement on the captured lands of West Bank and Gaza Strip since the 1967 Middle East War. Earlier, seven Palestinians were also injured by Israeli forces in the West Bank. They were protesting against the illegal Israeli settlements. In West Bank, over 3 million Palestinians are settled with more than 440,000 Israeli settlers among them. 
A trilateral meeting among Russian, Azerbaijani and Armenian leaders has begun in Moscow to discuss the Nagorno-Karabakh issue. President Vladimir Putin said uh, Russia's mediation efforts in Nagorno-Karabakh are aimed at establishing a stable ceasefire in the region. Putin said the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh is stable, adding that over 48,000 people have already returned home after the ceasefire. He said Russia follows the arrangement agreed by the OSCE Minsk Group in all its steps. Putin added that the leaders will discuss various issues, including the activities of the Russian peacekeeping forces currently deployed in the region. In November, uh, Russia broke a ceasefire in Nagorno-Karabakh region, which ended six weeks of intense fighting between Azerbaijan and Armenia. In Iraq, a policeman was killed and dozens of people injured in clashes between anti-government protesters and security forces. Officials say the clashes began in Habubi Square in the town of Nasiriya over the arrest of activists. Security forces used tear gas and batons to disperse the protesters who threw stones and rocks. Occasional gunfire could be heard as well. Iraq's military said in a statement that 33 other policemen were also injured in the violence. Security officials said at least 18 protesters were injured. The U.S. House of Representatives has decided to move to impeach President Donald Trump, calling him a threat to democracy. This comes after Wednesday's Capitol Hill storming by Trump supporters left five people dead. In a letter to her colleagues, Speaker Nancy Pelosi said the House will call on Vice President Mike Pence to wrest powers of the presidency from Trump. If Pence does not respond, the Democrats will proceed with impeaching the president for a historic second time. The House plans to introduce a charge of incitement of insurrection over the rights, but no Republican senator has said they will vote to convict him of wrongdoing in the Senate. China says it firmly opposes and strongly condemns the U.S. latest move on Taiwan. The backlash comes after the U.S. lifted restrictions on contacts between Washington and Taiwan officials. The Chinese foreign ministry said Beijing will resolutely fight back against any attempts to sabotage its interests. At a briefing, spokesperson Zhao Lijian said the Chinese people's resolve to defend the country's sovereignty is unshakable. He added they will not permit any person or force to stop the process of China's reunification. Earlier, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said the U.S.-Taiwan relationship will not be shackled by self-imposed restrictions. Taiwan is a sensitive issue for China, which considers the island a renegade province that must be brought under its rule. The global number of coronavirus cases has surpassed 90 million with more than 1.93 million deaths. More on the latest developments regarding COVID-19 from around the world in this report. The optimism fueled by COVID-19 vaccines is dampened as the world witnesses an unprecedented surge in deaths and cases, while new variants of the virus causes worries. Japan has found coronavirus variant in people arriving from Brazil, which is different from the ones in Britain and South Africa. Meanwhile, French authorities are racing to contain the more infectious variant of COVID-19 first found in Britain after detecting it in the ports of Mercy and in the Alps. Mexico and Russia have also confirmed the new strain of the virus first detected in Britain. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres say the worsening state of global spread and new strands call for a more strengthened global health response. While the need for international cooperation continues, we must expand our idea of what that means. In our interconnected world, we need a networked multilateralism so that global and regional organizations communicate and work together towards common goals. Meanwhile, Indonesia has extended its ban on foreign arrivals for another 14 days in a bid to control the transmission of the coronavirus. Spain, too, is mulling new restrictions after it recorded its biggest one-day jump in coronavirus cases since October. Meanwhile, the U.S. and Britain opened mass vaccination centers to boost immunization drive and deliver shots to all people. We're 1A currently. Uh, however, uh, Governor Cuomo just expanded the criteria to 1B, which will expand beyond health care providers uh, starting this week. And we're excited and ready to uh, provide vaccine to that group as well. 
Over in Asia, mainland China has reported 85 new locally transmitted cases of COVID-19, its biggest daily increase in more than five months. In Pakistan, 32 people have lost their lives to COVID-19 over the past 24 hours. This takes the country's death toll to 10,676. Health officials reported 1,877 new infections overnight. There are currently more than 35,000 active cases in the country. The health ministry says out of over 504,000 countrywide cases, more than 458,000 people have recovered. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Health has started registering frontline healthcare workers who will receive the first doses of the vaccine. All staff of hospitals dealing with the virus patients and healthcare workers appointed to inject vaccines will be immunized as a priority. Iran has asked South Korea to stop politicizing the seizure of its tanker by Iranian Revolutionary Guards. Earlier, Tehran denied allegations that seizure of the tanker and its 20-member crew amounted to hostage-taking. State media said Tehran press sold to release $7 billion in funds frozen amid U.S. sanctions. Meanwhile, South Korea's Vice Foreign Minister Joy jong kun has arrived in Tehran for talks on the issue. Talking to Shoy, Iran's Deputy Foreign Minister Abbas Rakhchi said Seoul should make way for legal proceedings. South Korea says it remains committed to engaging with North Korea. In his annual New Year's speech, President Moon Jae-in said Seoul's willingness to talk with Pyongyang remains unchanged. Moon said dialogue and co-prosperity were the key drivers of the peace process on the Korean Peninsula. He said cooperation on the issues like the coronavirus pandemic can lead to a breakthrough in stall talks. Moon added he will make last ditch efforts for the development in stalemated North Korea, US and inter-Korean talks. Meanwhile, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has been elected as general secretary of ruling Workers' Party. In Ethiopia, the military says it has killed 15 members of Tigray's former ruling party and captured eight others. According to state-run TV, those captured include the former president, Abe Waldo. It said the region's former deputy police commissioner is among those killed. The government declared victory in its conflict with the Tigray People's Liberation Front on the 28th of November after a month of fighting. But fugitive leaders of the TPLF had vowed to continue to fight from the mountains. Air strikes and battles since early November in Tigray are believed to have killed thousands of people. Earlier, the UN said fighting is continuing in some parts with over 2 million people in the need of aid. More stories to follow, but right after a short break, stay tuned. Welcome back. Saudi Arabia has unveiled a plan to build a zero-carbon city within the projected New York zone. It is the first major construction project for the $500 billion flagship business zone aimed at diversifying the economy. More in this report. There has been great interest around NEOM ever since its first announcement in 2017, with the mega development project being promoted as something straight out of science fiction. Based in northwestern Saudi Arabia, the zone is slated to be built from scratch on a 26,500 square kilometer area and link Jordan and Egypt via Saudi territory. Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman announced the launch of a zero-carbon city called The Line in the zone. He says the city will extend over 170 kilometer and will be able to house 1 million residents. It will have facilities like schools, health centers and green spaces. Today, as the chairman of the board of directors of NEOM, I present to you The Line, one million people city with a length of 170 kilometers that preserves 95 percent of the nature within Neom's land. Zero cars, zero streets, and zero carbon dioxide emission. One will be able to run their daily errands in just a five minutes walk, and one will be able to travel from the farthest point to the other in 20 minutes. With a 30% reduction in infrastructure cost, a 30% increase in the quality of product offered, 
and with 100% renewable energy. An official says construction will start in the first quarter of 2021. A NIAM statement says the city is expected to contribute $48 billion to the kingdom's gross domestic product and create 380,000 jobs. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a heavy emotional and material toll. So a seamstress in Mexico is trying to fill in the void left by those who lost the fight against the virus. More in this report. At her workshop in the northern border city of Ciudad Juarez in Mexico, Arendida Guerrero makes teddy bears for the family and friends of COVID-19 victims to console them. Each bear carries a message of love written on labels as a memory and addressed to the family members. A las personas que... To people who have lost their family members to COVID, in this case, they bring the clothes of their loved ones, which at one stage they used to wear the most, with what they were most remembered for. And then we make them this beautiful bear. Guerrero started making the bears in March 2020. Araceli Ramarez, who recently lost her father to COVID-19, received her teddy bear made with material from a shirt used by her beloved father. I think I will keep the teddy bear in my office, where I work, where I am most of the time, and I want him to be with me while I come to terms with this reality. Residents in Ciudad Juarez on the border with Texas have lost thousands of loved ones due to the high rates of COVID-19. And officials say the real number of infected people and deaths is likely significantly higher than the official count due to little testing. In Pakistan, Prime Minister Imran Khan said the Digital Pakistan Initiative will help the country move away from cash economy. He was speaking at the launch ceremony for ROST payment system in Islamabad. ROST is part of Prime Minister Imran Khan's Digital Pakistan vision to include poor segments of the society. According to the State Bank of Pakistan, uh, ROST is Pakistan's first instant payment system. It will en enable end-to-end -end digital payments among individuals, businesses and government entities instantaneously. The faster payment system will also be used to settle small value retail payments in real time. At the same time, it will provide cheap and universal access to all players in the financial industry, including banks and fintech. U.S. stocks dropped as investors assessed equity valuations and the outlook for more COVID-19 relief stimulus. Twitter shares also slumped following the permanent suspension of President Donald Trump's account. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is above half a percent. The S&P 500 has shed about three quarters of a percent. And the Nasdaq Composite is trading lower by about one and a half percent. Meanwhile, oil prices fell on renewed concerns about global fuel demand amid strict coronavirus lockdowns in Europe. Another weather situation from around the globe. That's all for now. With the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at Indus.news.